Thank you everyone for joining. Good afternoon. My name is Caleb Alderson Burak and I am the manager here at the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan. Every month PCAP asks someone to present either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk at a particular venue on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk. This presentation will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel, so keep your eyes open for that and feel free to pass on the link to anyone you know that would be interested or couldn't make it to this presentation. At the end of the presentation, I'll show you where you can find the links to all of our Native Prairie Speaker Series on the PCAB webpage and the links to our social media sites as well so that you can follow us on uh, social media. So there are about uh, 56 people registered for this webinar, so that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, much to everyone for coming out. Our next webinar will be Lauren Fitch from Cows and Fish in Alberta and he will be giving a train the trainer talk on February 9th. So keep your eyes open for the registration link uh, for that one in a couple weeks. So if you have any questions during this webinar, you will notice on the left hand side of your little webinar pop up menu that there's a place to type in questions. So feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar. It won't bother the presenter at all. And then at the end of the presentations, I will moderate questions. So I'd like to take a moment to note that in-kind support for this project has been given by Parks Canada, Grasslands National Park, and that this project was undertaken with the financial support of the Government of Canada and the Federal Department of the Environment. Now a bit about Heather. Heather received her Bachelor of Science in Environmental Biology from the University of Regina and completed a diploma in Integrated Resource Management from Sask Polytechnic. She has been working in and around Grasslands National Park on species at risk research since 2009 and started working full time for Parks Canada in the spring of 2013. Starting out as a technician, Heather conducted species at risk monitoring, native prairie restoration, and active management projects such as plague mitigation on black tailed prairie dog colonies and invasive species control. Currently, Heather is a resource management officer working with the bison, man bison management program the Fence Marking Initiative, and Greater Sagegrowth and Black-Tailed Prairie Dog Habitat Enhancement work. Currently, Heather lives on a farm about six miles outside of Valmarie. So with that, I will give control over to Heather and she can start the presentation. I can see your screen, Heather, but you might have yourself muted. Awesome. Unmuted. All right, Perfect. can you hear me now? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Kayla. Um, thanks for everybody for tuning in. I just wanted to give everybody a heads up as well that when practicing this presentation, I found that there was a delay in our internet, and so there is about an eight-second delay between slides. I'll try to accommodate it, but if not, we'll just have to take an eight second break between slides. Um, so this presentation is on Grasslands National Park's effort to reduce fence-related wildlife collisions. Um, I might also have a delay in the slides. So Grasslands National Park is located in southwest Saskatchewan. Um, that's the two green uh, blocks at the U.S. border there. It's an hour and a half south of Swift Current. It's one of the 47 Canadian national parks and one of only two national parks in all of Saskatchewan. It's the only park in all of Canada that represents the mixed grass prairies. The park is a mixture of upland grasslands, valley grasslands, shrublands, eroded badlands, and riparian communities. This diversity of habitat is why you can find over 20 species at risk within the park. For many species at risk, this is the northern edge of their range. Um, so Grasslands National Park consists of two blocks of land separated by 26 kilometers. Uh, we simply refer to them as the east block and the west block. The West Block is currently 500 kilometers squared, 
which is about 193 sections of land. The east block consists of about 265 kilometers squared, so it's about half the size of the west block, and about 102 sections of land. Um, the Frenchman River flows through the west block, and the Rock Creek and its tributaries flow through the east block, and both of these river systems flow into the Milk River. Uh, the park management plan states that parks lands will be restored using an integrated restoration approach for cultivated lands and areas dominated by exotic grasses. Grassland National Park has several active management activities that are conducted annually and focus on primary producers to restore and maintain functional prairie. Um, these are some of the examples of our active management activities. So for prescribed fires, Grassland National Park will use fire to remove dead vegetation and litter. We're going to increase nutrient availability, and burned areas are preferentially grazed by ungulates. Uh, we also want to increase habitat diversity. We have a revegetation program, which focuses on previously cultivated fields. One of our last cultivated fields within Grasslands National Park boundary was reseeded with native seed in 2014, and was approximately 175 acres. We mow to prevent the spread of invasive species and to decrease fuel loads in key areas. These areas are around campgrounds, trails, important infrastructure, and heritage buildings. We do end up spraying within the park uh, when it's necessary to use chemical to control invasive species. Um, such invasive species are leafy spurge, common burdock, and crested wheatgrass. And finally, grazing. So we have both domestic cattle and bison grazing within the park. And we use grazing to achieve some of our ecological objectives. Um, grazing, in particular, alters the plant community and plant structure and will help to maintain a variety of micro-ecosystems throughout the park and encourage a wider variety of species to develop. We currently have grazing in both the west and east block of the park, although our bison grazing is currently limited to the west block. Uh, fences are a useful tool for implementing grazing regimes which benefit wildlife, but there's also a downside where fences create migration barriers and are a cause of mortality for wildlife. Some research that was done in Colorado and Utah showed the mortality rates of these three ungulates per kilometer fence line. Typically, ungulates die because they snare their legs and are unable to escape. Uh, mortalities are most common from animals getting caught between the top two wires. And they found that mule deer experienced higher fence mortality rates than elk or pronghorn because they actually cross fences more often. Elk and pronghorn were less skilled than mule deer at successfully crossing fences, but tended to attempt crossing less often than mule deer. Pronghorn tend to crawl through or under a fence. They are reluctant to jump over, although they are capable. They also found that ungulate mortalities were highest during August, which um, was the weaning of fawns, and mortality for juveniles was actually eight times greater than adults. Uh, Stevens studied avian collisions for his thesis and found that 77% of collisions with fences in Idaho was actually stage growth. Other species found during the study um, were species such as the gray partridge, sharp-tailed grouse, short-eared owls, long-eared owls, great horned owls, virginous hawks, horned larks, and western meadow larks. So there are quite a few species that can uh, die as a result to a collision with fences, um, but the study shows that there is way higher chance of being greater sage growth. Uh, he found that fences within a 500 meters of a lek are at the greatest threat, and increasing visibility of these fences may not be enough to decrease the risk of mortality. So fences within a 500 meters from a lek um, will be completely removed. Fences unnecessary for planned grazing activities will be removed to reduce collision hazards for sage growth. This will also reduce perches for sage growth predators and perches for songbird nest parasites such as cowbirds.
principal goal for Grasslands National Park and grazing is to have a variation in grazing over time and space. We want to uh, complement what is happening outside the park. We want areas of the park to be grazed lightly, moderately, and some less rested. This will hopefully increase the diversity of wildlife habitat within the region. This is one reason why bison grazing was reintroduced to a section of the park. Uh, bison herds are not as common outside the park as domestic cattle. We want to minimize permanent fencing and try to eliminate the risk entirely where possible. We want to ensure that fences that are needed for grazing are wildlife friendly. That means that the top two wires are barbless, which make them safer for ungulates to cross over. And the bottom wire needs to be 18 inches off the ground so that pronghorn can cross underneath. We want to be following greater sage growth best management practices. This includes no intensive grazing before July 1st, and that uh, fences are marked to enhance visibility. Uh, this is a map of all the fences in Grasslands National Park. I've also overlaid uh, the road network so you can see kind of the fragmentation within the park. We have a total of 550 kilometers of fence in varying conditions. Our perimeter fence and our bison pastures are constructed of wooden fence posts that are five bars. The top are five wires, but the top two are smooth and the bottom is 18 inches off the ground. Um, roads traveling through the park are adding to this fragmentation. Um, a few of these roads are gravel. The majority of them are two track trails. One thing that is missing off this map that I wanted to add are the power lines. So that's just something else there that would be a cause of collision mortality but hasn't been added to the map. We have three ways to mitigate the impacts of fences. So the first one is removing fences. This is a 100% reduction in collision risk. We have a target to remove at least eight kilometers of fence per year. Another mitigation is the let down clips, or uh, it's a way to temporarily have a fence put up and you can take it down at times when it's sensitive. I'll explain that in a bit more detail in the upcoming slide. And then we have fence marking. This is used when the two other options aren't feasible. We need that fence to be up year round. It's a permanent fence, but we want to increase the visibility. And we also have a target where we want to mark at least 16 kilometers of fence per year within the park. Fence removal in the west block. So far we have, or fence removal in the west block. So far we've removed at least six kilometers of fence. Um, the majority of our interior fences in the west block are within newly acquired lands, which are being leased out for grazing. Um, one of the challenges is that we need to uh, accommodate the grazing that's happening by the lessees, so we need to work with them to determine which fences are not needed for grazing and can be removed. In 2015, our fences were a combination of old stack yards, fences in poor condition, um, but they were within or adjacent to the shrubland communities. Fence removal in the east block, we've removed about 35 kilometers of fence. 5.2 kilometers was removed in 2015 and approximately 30 kilometers was removed in 2014. Um, some challenges when trying to do fence removal is trying to find staff or find contractors that are available to do this. In 2015, uh, between or within the east and west block, we actually managed to remove three kilometers more than our target. The letdown clips were installed between the parkland and a neighboring landowner on approximately two kilometers of fence line. This gives land managers the ability to take down the fence during high risk periods, for example, when sage growth are congregating on lex. It provides the ability to install the fence later in the summer when it's needed for grazing purposes. This isn't as ideal as removing the fence entirely, but it can be an option for decreasing impacts of fences on wildlife. 
you can see on the right hand side the two different methods of attaching it to the fence post. So on the wooden fence post you can just screw those clips in. For the metal T post you can actually buy a hand tool that will let you crimp the clip around the post. Um, one of the challenges is that you need to have either staff or the neighbor willing and available to take down and put up the fence. And management of this fence will be ongoing. Okay, into fence marking. We started marking fences back in 2012. Our target again is to mark at least 16 kilometers of fence annually. Um, what we do to mark these fences is we install three inch pieces of vinyl siding to the top two wires of barbed fences. This will make the fence wires visible to wildlife. For each section of fence, um, which is approximately 16 feet, you need eight pieces of siding and you alternate between the white and dark gray. The idea is that the white markers are highly visible in summer and during periods of low light and the dark gray markers are supposed to be visible during winter against the snowy the background. Marking is limited to the top two wires of a fence as many animals don't tend to fly or go underneath an object. So having the top two wires should be sufficient. And the reason why we go through this trouble is that there's been some research done back in 2012 that showed that marking fences actually reduced collisions by 83%. The study by Stevens et al. actually recommends prioritizing fences within two kilometers of LEX. As the, dis the distance from LEX increased, the fence collision decreases. They found that collisions still occurred on marked fences that were within 500 meters to a LEX. So those fences will actually be prioritized for removal. Um, the multi-scale assessment study showed that seg segments without wooden fence posts and segments that were greater than four meters are actually a higher risk of collision. They recommend we prioritize areas with moderate to high fence densities, which are greater than one or more than one kilometer of fence per kilometer square. And those are areas within two kilometers of an active lek. And they also prior, uh, recommend prioritizing areas that are, that are flat or gently rolling terrain. We have some objectives on what we were looking for when we want to mark fences. So what we're looking for is a material that can increase the visibility of fences to wildlife without being visually obtrusive to visitors to the park. We need to avoid adding weight or wind resistance to the fence. We want it to be inexpensive and easy to acquire and relatively quick to install. We want it to be minimal skill level to apply and be durable enough to last for years in extreme weather. And we needed something that attached securely to the wire so that wildlife and livestock are unable to tamper with it. Our solution was to use vinyl undersill trim siding. So we have white and dark gray. We found that you need approximately 1,650 markers per kilometer of fence which is um, about 35 strips of this undersill siding. And we cut it using a laminate cutter. The other option is a miter saw. We've rigged up a system where we actually attach this laminate cutter to a picnic table, as you can see in the photos. Um, this allows us to cut for uh, lengths of siding at one time. Um, some of the challenges that we've found with fence marking is trying to find a way to mark the smooth wires. So I was saying that we have the top two wires are smooth, um, but we've had issues with trying to install those fence markers. We put those flags on, in the bottom left photo you can see those flags on the top wire, but we found that 
the next year when we went out there, there would hardly be any left, and some would be chewed off by wildlife, some would blow off, and some of them would just slide to the one side of the fence. It wasn't very effective at making the, the wire visible. Um, so we're trying some other types of material. Some suggestions are PVC pipe, or trying to figure out some way with an adhesive to make those three inch pieces of siding stick to the top two wires. Um, something that we're still trying to work out, I guess. We found that they are time consuming to cut and install. Um, this is something that I guess is a challenge, but it's something that we'll just have to deal with trying to find the time to cut them and install them. Timing is also an issue, so coordinating with fencing upgrades and replacements happening in the park. Um, to be efficient, we don't really want to be marking a fence that won't be slated or will be slated for removal or upgrades. Um, so it's trying to just coordinate with other staff members to figure out the future of a particular fence and mark it if we need to. This is a map of what we've marked so far in the east block. Within the east block and west block, we've marked a total of 54 kilometers of fence. 7.7 7 of that was in the west block, and 46.2 of that is in the east block. So it was quite a bit of fence line. The way that we were able to achieve this was with our volunteers. They're some of our most favorite people. We've had the pleasure of taking out locals, tourists, high school students um, through the Prairie Learning Center. We've also had provincial and federal government employees come out and help. What we're looking for in our volunteers are people who are physically able to walk up to two miles at a time and people who love the outdoors. We found that we can typically mark one mile of fence in two hours' time. Some of the challenges for volunteers could be carrying heavy bags of markers. Sometimes it is over long distances when we're trying to access remote areas. For 2016, we have a volunteer event in the works. We want to plant up to 3,000 sage plugs for a greater sage growth habitat enhancement project. We also want to mark our target of at least 16 kilometers of fence within the east and west block. Um, this will likely be at the end of May or beginning of June, and we'll be uh, camping possibly remotely in the park and then going out and marking fences as well as planting stage plugs. If this is of interest to anyone or you know of anybody that wants to come volunteer, you can check out Grasslands Volunteer website. Um, so far, the fence marking project's not up there yet, so you'll have to check back. You can also contact myself directly at heather.set at pc.gc.ca. Uh, at some point in time, my email will be changing, though, to at canada.ca. Are there any questions? All right, thanks for that, Heather. Uh, there was one question. Uh, what is the recommended spacing for the fence markers? Um, so for the fence markers, when you have, you want four on the top wire between two posts. So they're roughly a couple feet apart. You basically just want them spread out evenly so that um, it's visual. All right, thank you. Uh, if there's any other questions out there, um, I'll go ahead and show uh, the links where they're posted, where our presentations are posted. And uh, I don't have any other questions right now, but uh, feel free to type in a question and I will um, look at it here after I show our websites. Um, so this is our uh, Prairie Conservation Action Plan website. So on the home page here, uh, you can, if you go to the bottom, you can see that we have the links to our Facebook page, our Twitter account, and our YouTube page. And we also are on Instagram now, at SKPCAP. And then if you go to Communications tab, and then Native Prairie Speaker Series, all of the presentations uh, on all of the links are here. 
you can watch all of them on our YouTube page. So Heather's will be posted here uh, in a couple days. And then while I have you, uh, the website to our upcoming Prairie Conservation and Endangered Species Conference that PCAP is hosting, uh, coming up fast, February 16th to 18th in Saskatoon. Uh, this is the website here, so you can go ahead. A full conference program is available now, which is very exciting. So you can look at the full program, the full schedule, see what kind of talks there are, and you can also uh, register here. So it looks like I have a couple more questions now for you, Heather. Um, how do you manage grazing distribution in areas you've removed fence from? Um, well, we have a, a project in the works where we're actually trying to remove a bunch of fence, and we will be moving the cattle around with horseback. There's also the option of you know, removing permanent fences, and then when we need to graze an area, we can put in temporary electric fence. Um, so we're still, you know, managing the distribution of cattle on the landscape, but we're trying to minimize permanent fencing. Okay, awesome. Uh, good, we've got a few questions now. Uh, Kinsman Enterprises in Prince Albert will cut the siding into three-inch lengths for a very reasonable cost. It's a good tip there, I guess, if anybody is interested in that. That is very interesting. <laughs> I would recommend uh, they send myself an email, please. <laughs> Okay, good note. So whoever made that comment, maybe uh, shoot Heather off an email, uh, which will be in the follow-up uh, email for the webinar, but I'll mention that again at the end. But Okay, another question. For the PVC pipe option, would it be one solid piece that goes from post to post along the top wire? Um, I don't know if it'd have to go um, from fence post to the next fence post. It might just have to be a longer strip. We haven't actually used that technique yet, so it might, yeah, we'd have to find a way to make sure that it stays put on the top wires, but, you know, at the same time, I don't know what that would be like to have an entire strip of PVC pipe along the entire fence. Um, so that's something we're going to have to look into. Right, good point. Uh, another question, there has been some research showing that pronghorn avoid marked fences, meaning that they expend more energy than normal. How are you addressing that? Hmm, I would say that I was unaware of that. Um, yeah, I wasn't aware that they would avoid marked fences, I guess. Something to consider. Yeah, I guess that's something to look into. It's an interesting point. What was, who did that research, sorry? Um, not sure if the person who asked that question uh, maybe knows they can type it in or maybe they can shoot you off an email afterwards as well and maybe take a look yeah for sure send me an email yeah um uh that person just said they'll contact you after so uh that'll be an interesting point to talk about how does making the top two wires smooth and raising the bottom wire affect abil the ability to hold livestock um having the top two wires smooth and the bottom one smooth we haven't had any issues with livestock getting out. Um, yeah. Okay. I think as long as we have those barbed wires in the middle, we don't, you know, the bottom wire being smooth is still low enough that we don't have calves sneaking out. Right. Because, I mean, by the time the cattle get in there to graze, the calves are quite a bit bigger. There could be an issue, you know, if cattle are, are trying to push on the fence or rub on the fence, we do find that smooth wire can, you know, break easier just because cattle are rubbing on it more because it doesn't have any barbs on it. Um, but I find by having that second one from the bottom barbed that we haven't really had any issue keeping livestock in. Okay. Another question, as bison require different, different fencing than cattle, are there any differences between the mitigation plans on the two fencing types? Uh, the mitigation is the same. The fence is somewhat different. So for our cattle, we don't require the five wire fence. It doesn't need to be as high as for bison. Um, yeah, but we still like to mark them. And for the bison, we don't have any, you know, let down fences. And we've already removed all of our interior fence. It's just that perimeter fence around the bison herd. Okay. Uh, looks like we have one more question here. 
How many kilometers of fence were removed in the bison holding area in the west block prior to introducing the bison? That's a very good question, and I do not know the answer. I'm assuming a little bit. Yeah. yeah, I don't know, because they were, like the ranches were quite large, but there would have been some cross fences in there, um, but I really don't know how much was removed. Okay, well, yeah, maybe they can follow up with you about that. If Yeah, for sure, I could probably you know, <laughs> find the answer no problem and get back to you. Yeah. All right, well, if there, um, I'll just kind of wrap things up, but if anybody has any more questions, feel free to still type them in, and I can... Uh, ask them at the very end here, but I'd just like to again thank Grasslands National Park, Parks Canada for in-kind support for this project and that financial support was undertaken with the government, from the Government of Canada and the Federal Department of the Environment. Uh, as mentioned, as soon as you close the webinar and uh, in tomorrow at this time, you will get um, a follow-up email uh, with a couple of survey questions and if you could just take the few moments to answer those questions uh, that would help us uh, greatly with uh, some of our funding opportunities so um, and Heather's email will be in the follow-up email so if you have any other questions or want to follow up with her about anything please feel free to do so um, so thank you again for attending this webinar and uh, keep an eye out for the next one which will be on February 9th and it looks like we have one more question here uh, Miwasan has been trying green plastic banding to delineate the top wire at the northeast swale near Saskatoon. The banding is one centimeter width in size. The banding seems to be effective, well, however, it has to be inspected on a regular basis to repair and mend. We use green duct tape to mend the banding. I would not recommend using this on large par parcels like Grasslands National Park. So I guess just a comment, it's kind of interesting. Um, the kind of different things that are being done throughout the province based on the area and the resources, but um, Yeah, that's very interesting and if people have any more suggestions or want to talk about it some more just feel free to contact me Definitely All right, well if there's not any other questions, I guess we can wrap it up and uh, this presentation will be uh, placed on our website and our YouTube page so if you want to pass it along to anyone else who didn't make the presentation, feel free to do so and uh, feel free to contact Heather with any other uh, questions in the next few days. All right. Okay, well, I don't think there's any other questions. So thank you very much for the presentation, Heather. It was very interesting. I think we all learned something. Well, thank you, Kayla. Okay, thank you for everyone for joining. Have a good day. You too.